Welcome everyone. In this video I'm going to be talking about active imagination technique, especially as it relates to uh, what Jung has said about it, and I do take a little guidance from Robert Johnson and his book Inner Work. So I've compiled this little document here. This is, well I should say my technique is based on Jung's technique, because that's just, that's what I first learned, and that's what came naturally to me. Although Jung's personal technique is not necessarily going to be something that everybody is going to work for everybody. And I'm going to be talking about this later on in the end. He does recognize this. He recognizes that there are individual differences. But anyway, so I've compiled this little document here. I'm going to be providing it in the description. It's going to be a PDF format, so you can download it and reference it. You can alter it, you can use it as a guide, whatever you'd like to do, just for your benefit. And in making this, I went through, I kind of reviewed Robert Johnson's, the second half of his book, Inner Work, which deals specifically with active imagination. And I also reviewed a lot of Jung's um, collected works. Primarily towards the end is where I actually put the footnotes in. And in the description, I'm going to be putting in a list of the passages from his collected works in this format. Collected works, CW, number, that's the volume number, section or sections, and then provide the sections. So that's going to be there for you to reference if you would like to read for yourself what Young says about this and how he treated his patients and clients in guiding them through active imagination. So, let's get started. First thing about active imagination, obviously, is the setting. And in sum, it's going to be ideal for you to have a place that is quiet, alone, and comfortable. Because this is going to take roughly 30 to 60 minutes. Maybe more or less slightly for, you know, just individual variation. But that's about how much time it's going to take. For a session. So obviously, you want to be comfortable during that time, but you also want solitude where you can think, where you can concentrate, where you can behold the unconscious and you can look within your mind free of distraction. And I could also put down here in the fourth one, especially when you're starting out, I didn't because I'm going to discuss this in a moment, but you might also prepare by dispelling doubts. So I want to read a quote by Young. In Collected Works, Volume 7, Section 323, just by way of introduction, he says, We know that practically everyone has not only the peculiarity, but also the faculty of holding a conversation with himself. And he gives the example thereafter concerning how we talk to ourselves. You know, if you're in a predicament or a conundrum, you, you talk to yourself and you say, What should I do? Well, you're speaking to yourself. And he says, this really is an unlike act of imagination. He goes on by mentioning that the dissociation required for our dialectics with the anima is not so terribly difficult. It's not as unusual, it's not as strange and difficult as you think. He says, the art of it consists only in allowing our invisible partner to make herself heard and putting the mechanism of expression momentarily at her disposal without being overcome by the distaste one naturally feels at playing such an apparently ludicrous game with oneself, or by doubts as to the genuineness of the voice of one's interlocutor. So this is why I mention dispelling doubts, because he mentions that the art of it is allowing the subconscious, whom he calls the invisible partner, to make herself heard. And what, we, what I say is going to be, you're going to see why that's relevant in a moment. But it's dispelling also the distaste one will feel. It seems almost like this is a game. And you'll wonder, am I, is this just a mind game I'm playing with myself? Is this, am I really being spoken to by my subconscious? Is this, is this actually significant and beneficial, or is this just some ludicrous mind game? And he says that the key, the art, of doing this consists in not being overcome by this distaste and this sense of ludicrousness concerning what's being done. 
Robert Johnson says on page 150 of his book Inner Work, even if a person is frivolous and deliberately tries to fabricate something, to conjure up something silly and stupid, to imagine a pure fiction, the material that comes up through the imagination still represents some hidden part of that individual. It can't be made up from thin air. It has to come from somewhere inside the person who is producing the images. This is concerning dispelling doubts, in that if you're also worried, oh, am I just making this all up? Well, I mean, you are making it up in a certain sense. But you're really, what you're really asking, is this something I'm consciously making up, or is this something that something within me is making up in the sense of like a dream? Isn't In a certain sense, a dream is made up. But it's definitely not coming from your conscious mind, is the idea. And Robert Johnson says, in assuaging those doubts that one might have, that whatever happens ultimately still is coming from some hidden part of you. It's coming from within your mind. And he had a patient, or a client, I guess, and he tells a story in the book that his client was coming to him week after week, you know, and he would bring his active imagination accounts and they would discuss and interpret. And eventually his client just sprung on him. He said, you know, I've just been making all this up. This is just a bunch of garbage. Like, I've just been making all this up. And look, you know, you've been interpreting it and taking it seriously. And Robert Johnson's response was, yes, you've been making it up. Where did it come from? It still came from somewhere within you. And he began to interpret it. And it, and it even then, even though it was made up, it revealed so much about this man that eventually he was convinced concerning it, that it was that this is an actual, legitimate, beneficial thing. Even though he had made it up, it's still, it's as though the subconscious speaks whether you like it or not. And he tried to make it up, and yet, nonetheless, he couldn't silence the subconscious. It spoke through that. It manifested through that. So, with that, let's move to the invitation, which I have in brackets. An act of recognition, this is the invitation, is an act of recognition that the subconscious is a real, sentient part of you, and yet distinct from your conscious mind. That's why we invite the subconscious. And the reason I have it in brackets is because I'm not really sure it's entirely necessary, especially after you've been doing this for some time. So concerning the invitation, Robert Johnson says, the first step in active imagination is to invite the creatures of the unconscious to come up to the surface and make contact with us. We invite the inner persons to start the dialogue. How do we make this invitation? We begin by taking our minds off the external world around us and focusing on the imagination, which then relates back to setting, somewhere where you can focus on the imagination. And the invitation recognizes that there are, he says, creatures and persons. There are facets of the unconscious, and they're not all unified necessarily into one singular personality, or they won't necessarily manifest as one character that's always there every single time. You know, you will talk to characters and active imagination that are vastly different. My first active imagination was, you know, with a farmer. And that represented a certain part of me. My second act of imagination was with, I just describe him as a man, and he's totally different. Representing in a totally, a totally different set of concerns and problems and troubles with the unconscious. My third act of imagination is different from the first and the second one. Now, on the other hand, my later act of imaginations do have this variation, but it's less common. And more commonly, I encounter my inner voice, and it may be personified in different forms, but it's clearly the same personality or the same facet. It's the same underlying creature, I guess we would say, as Robert Johnson does, that's speaking to me, although manifested in different ways. I can tell it's the same. All this to say, we make the invitation, and when it goes something like this, you would say something like, subconscious, I invite you to Make your concerns known to me, and I am devoting this time to listening to you, to observing and interacting with you that we may have peace, that we may harmonize, that we may cease conflicting, 
and cease warring and rather like friends who would come together and solve our problems together cooperatively it would go something like this i believe it's more helpful when you start out as you go on in the literal sense it's as though you make a genuine relationship a genuine friendship that will form with the other half of your totality this basically is robert johnson's way of saying the, the unconscious or the subconscious and the, you know when two friends meet they may choose to dispense with formalities i mean that they may you know when you are approaching your subconscious and active imagination you know the fifth or the tenth time or the twentieth time or whatever it is for you you don't always need to do an invitation i, I find it a little bit a little bit like ritualistic you know just doing it because you've always done it or because you associate it with this rather than doing it for an actual purpose but anyway this is up to you this is just my opinion on the matter the beginning so imagining the beginning or in i mean not in the sense of active imagination but put yourself in the shoes of having a daydream envision yourself in in the state of daydreaming and when you do that you feel what you feel in the beginning of active imagination meaning that you sense the withdrawal of your mind within itself the feeling of withdrawal into the mind and the sense of thoughts coming forth from within rather than from without when you're outside or when you're at a sporting event or when you're watching tv it's as though thoughts come from without it's as though your mind is responding to everything that happens and it's reacting and what you're thinking is in response to what you're sensing and perceiving outside of you and in contrast the reason i connect this with daydreams the reason i bring that imagery is that it gives you a sense when you daydream it's as though you're retreating into your mind it's like your eyes are turning from the outside and it's like yes your eyes are open yes you're awake and you're conscious but it's as though your perception is turned even then in and in on itself and it's now it, now it's though you're witnessing the mind you're witnessing the inner workings and the subconscious manifests itself through this and this is something that young observed and the reason that he encouraged his his patients his clients to do this withdrawing from the external concentrating on the internal that's what i mean by this secondly quiet your mind your inner voice meaning don't think to yourself don't speak within your mind don't comment on things you know when like if you were walking down the street and you see just something ridiculous you might think in your mind that's ridiculous because you don't want to say it necessarily but you still have this inner voice that provides commentary you know that you speak to yourself inside of your mind with this voice and my suggestion is to avoid this don't speak with your mind rather just observe because what you're waiting for is what i typically call the scene you're observing and images will come and go and i'm showing you now on the screen kind of what it looks like for me when i close my eyes and i've quieted my mind and i'm focusing on the inside it's like two to four images a second roughly will kind of flash through your mind hazily not in great detail but they'll you know it's like one after the other and you just kind of watch this happen for a time you know because as you do this it's almost like your eyes are adjusting in a certain sense it's like your mind's eye is adjusting like when you go from dark to light or light to dark you know literally in the physical world your eyes have to adjust and it's like when you're focusing and you're clearing your mind and and you're now observing the subconscious and the images that just spontaneously proceed from within yourself it's like your your mind's eye is having to adjust and so you know these images come and go and you don't necessarily need to seize upon the first one although sometimes that is the one the first image that you see will take hold sometimes i've had this happen before in my own experience and on the other hand it's not the first one like in my first act of imagination 
you know, I did what I've just been describing to you and images came and went and came and went. And I was kind of like, well, which one, you know, do I just like, am I supposed to choose one of these to focus on or am I supposed to wait? Well, eventually one came, you know, of the field of corn that I've described in my first act of imagination. And so I, I opened my eyes up and I was questioning, am I doing this right? Is this ludicrous? Like Young said, is this ludicrous? Is this really, is this just some crazy mind game I'm playing? And then I shut my eyes again and went back to it and just kind of collected myself and was like, all right, let's keep trying this. And sure enough, behold, you know, the image returned. The same image of the cornfield returned with even greater clarity. And this is what I mean when I say an image will take hold. As they're flashing through your mind, one eventually, in my own experience, comes that's more strong, more persistent, or it brings with it more emotion or profundity or sense of significance and weight than the others. And I find that more often than not, this is the scene. This is what your subconscious is drawing your mind's eye towards. This is what you should focus on. Once this image takes hold, let events unfold. Meaning, don't judge what you see. Don't be like, oh, I don't want to be outside. I don't want this rain. I don't want, you know, I don't want to be here. Or wouldn't it look nicer with this color or that or this plant here? Don't judge it. Let them unfold. It's an act of respect, kind of like the invitation of just letting the subconscious bear itself to you and show you itself without sitting in judgment and not critiquing it and tacitly saying that you dis you find it distasteful by needing to change or alter what you see rather just let them let the events unfold and enter in it's kind of a commitment once you accept this is the scene and you start placing yourself there you know you you start standing there in your mind's eye and you start looking around you act as an observer it's like you're you have skin in the game now you know like you're emotionally invested in this scene and in seeing what the subconscious is saying and i think that the subconscious is aware of this you're now placing yourself there and saying i'm vulnerable you know I'm vulnerable, I'm in the scene, I'm standing there, and I'm experiencing what, what is being created by the subconscious. I'm experiencing the imagery, I'm experiencing the situation. And you observe. That's kind of what I did in my first act of imagination. I started looking around, and I wrote this in my notes. You know, I would look here, and I would see the birds in the sky. Oh, I look at the fence, and I see there, okay, the fence... It's kind of old and it's handmade. You're just kind of looking, waiting for the subconscious to engage you. And this is something that I just allow the subconscious to do. I don't start calling out, you know, in the act of imagination. I don't, in my mind, start calling out and demanding to meet. But I'm just allowing the subconscious to shape the situation, to shape the imagery and the events as it wishes. I allow it to manifest itself as it chooses. And once it engages you, you then become a participant. What does the engagement look like? Well, just using again my first act of imagination, it was the farmer walking up. And in many other act of imaginations, it's the same thing. A character will approach you. Or, as you kind of explore the scene, you will come across a character. And I've also had, had experiences where the inner voice just starts talking. And I'm like, okay, you know, the subconscious has engaged me. It's invited me now to respond to it. It's spoken something to me. It's said something. It's inviting my participation now. Then you participate. So you let the events unfold as an observer. Feeling, experiencing, taking part in the scene as it's being shaped by the subconscious. And when it chooses to engage you and how it chooses to engage you, then you participate. And I would just make a note that this is the difference between active imagination 
and daydreaming, active imagination and meditation, active imagination and channeling. Or at least this is a, a point of difference in that you aren't merely passive. You aren't merely witnessing, but you are participating. You are speaking. You are being spoken to. You are asking questions. You are answering questions. You know, it's a very conscious, deliberate, active, hence the term active imagination, experience. During. During the active imagination, what occurs is meant to be recorded as it happens. I have a quote that I'll share with you later on from Young, where he does recommend this. Specifically, says keeping a running transcript is very important. If you wait till the end to write everything down, you will forget things. You will leave things out, deliberately or accidentally. And perhaps the third category, quote, accidentally, end quote. But you will lose some of the experience if you wait to write later. I want to just skip this just for a moment and address your question, which I'm anticipating, which is, well, if I stop, you know, and I'm always pausing as things are being said to write something down, won't I miss out on something? Or will a subconscious just leave, you know? Like if I let this image out of my mind for even a second, will it come back? Like, can I return to it? And the answer is yes. You can return to it. And not once have I found it to vanish. Not once have I, you know, open my eyes, write it, write down what was said, close it, close my eyes, refocus. And not once have I found that it's gone. Invariably, at least in my own experience, the image returns and I'm back in the shoes of, of me standing in the scene, just as it was. So I say the subconscious is patient. Robert Johnson notes, Regarding this writing, recording, he describes doing it at a typewriter. This is in 1986 he said this. For us, it may mean at your computer, or with your phone, or my preferred way, handwriting. And I don't recommend handwriting because like, I'm some advocate of archaic ways of doing things, or I reject technology or anything. Nothing like this. For me, there's two reasons. It enables you to conduct the act of ac imagination in a place of your choosing, not necessarily wherever your computer is or your desk is. Secondly, paper is inherently distraction-free, at least in comparison to phones, which are designed to consume your attention and to get your attention and maintain your attention. You do what works for you. What works for me is handwriting. For me, it's just, it provides less distraction. Even the light itself is distracting, and I'm easily distracted. You know, I have a hard time just sitting still and doing something for an hour. So having the paper, that helps me. And also just the act of, you know, physically writing is kind of a way to get like the fidgets out. You know, you don't want to fidget because now you, you have a pencil and you have a paper. If you want to fidget, listen to what's being said and, you know, write it down. <laughs> That works for me. Do what works for you. And as I said, the subconscious is patient. I have not found it to leave as I write. And I've had sessions where they're interrupted, and then hours later, I return. And I would even say something to the subconscious, like, I have to go now, you know, I need to take care of this, or whatever. But I return to it even hours later without problem. You know, you do the same thing. You go back, you sit down. You close your eyes, you clear your mind, and then sure enough, the image comes back, the same character standing there, and it resumes. It's almost like it welcomes you back and is like, oh, thank you for coming back, you know, like, let's continue the conversation, basically. Robert Johnson notes this specifically in Inner Work on page 153. He's had clients who, you know, they're, there's one persistent act of imagination, one particular scene or one fantasy i think is what he calls it that persists and you know every day he describes a man who every day or every other day whenever he had free time he would return to the same scene 
you know, day after day after day, week after week, and it would just pick up and continue where it left off. You don't have to worry that, oh, if you, if you open your eyes or if you're not, you know, if you don't just save all the writing for later, then that's going to go away or you'll lose the scene. It won't. And the, the deeper you build your relationship with the subconscious, the more confidence you'll have in its own, its own humanity. You know, it's part of you. How would you handle it if you're in a conversation on the phone and somebody says, Hey, I really got to take care of this. You know, I'll call you back in a couple hours. Well, you know, for most people, that's not a big deal. And the subconscious being part of you and being human is very similar. Recording what transpires is a demonstration of respect for the subconscious. Because you're communicating to it explicitly or and at least implicitly, if you don't actually say it during the invitation, that you care about what it says. And you care to the point that you're willing to write it down as it happens accurately. And so that you can return later and reflect upon it. You're communicating that it has meaning to you and you take it seriously. So I wanted to discuss a little bit what I've touched upon concerning how does this actually work. After you see the image take hold, you write a description of the scene. You describe what you see, where you're looking. What is what time of day is it? What what surroundings are there? Sometimes, and I've had this happen, the scene may be like a memory that you have or a place that you've been that you associate with or that, that impacts you strongly, that has some meaning. And it's almost like that place is frozen in time. You know, normally, like if it's, I've had active imagination and it took place in my high school. But there was nobody there, nobody in the street, nobody in the school, nobody in the parking lot. It's like it's frozen in time. And it's just me and the interlocutor, as Robert Johnson says. But you kind of note that. You close your eyes once more. So you've seen the image take hold. You describe the scene. You close your eyes again. You kind of look around. Okay, when you see something of note, you write it down. After you describe it more on paper, then you open your eyes or you close your eyes again, refocusing, and voila, the scene is still there. That's just how it works, I guess, for me at least, without presuming that everyone is like this. For me, the scene remains, which is also kind of a confirmation that this is indeed the scene that I'm meant to focus on. This is indeed what the subconscious is manifesting in my mind. And during conversation, especially later in my future active imaginations, I think starting with like number five and going onward, it would be very common for entire paragraphs to be spoken, just line after line, you know, five or ten sentences, just, you know, one after the other. And so you don't have time to just close your eyes. Okay, you write a sentence, you know, you close your eyes again. It didn't work that way in this case for me. I would open my eyes and just start writing as I hear, and it's just like you have the ability to focus on the act of imagination and see it happening with your eyes open. And that's very similar again to daydreaming, where you it's like your eyes are open, and in some sense you're aware of your surroundings, and yet you're literally witnessing the inner world manifest itself and unfold before your eyes at the same time. And so in this case where, you know, it's almost like a, I think the word that's most appropriate would be like a sermon is being delivered to me by my subconscious. And, you know, there's entire paragraphs speaking and it's like, I can't write fast enough, but I'm just looking at the paper writing and, but I'm, my, my mind's eye is still focused on the scene and I'm just writing as I hear the experience continuing, even as my eyes are open and I'm writing. And you can intuitively understand this with the example of when you're using your phone or playing on your phone and someone's talking to you, your mind is focused simultaneously on your phone and what you're writing and what is happening around you and what is being said to you. 
And the only difference with active imagination in this case is that your mind is not focused on two parts of the external world. Your mind is focused on the one hand in the external world, like your whatever you're taking your record on, whatever you're recording the speech and the dialogue on, and the other half is focused on the internal setting, the internal scene unfolding before you. You're straddling the line between the conscious and the unconscious. And with one hand you receive from the unconscious, with the other you set it down in the conscious realm. With one hand, well, I guess we would say on the one hand, you're hearing from the unconscious, and the other half of you that's in the conscious realm is writing this down. You may need time to reflect on what is said, to prepare your response, to re prepare a good answer, a thoughtful answer. For me, rather than thinking, well, this would make my subconscious impatient, or the scene will fade away if I don't answer quickly, rather this pleases my subconscious. To take time to reflect, to honestly examine yourself, because it asks me a lot of questions that require genuine self-examination, and that doesn't happen at the snap of a finger. And it pleases my subconscious to thoughtfully consider, reflect, and respond. So I say, do not rush. You may think that the subconscious compared to your conscious mind is rather insignificant. You may think that you're just speaking to a simplistic sliver of your intellect or your psyche. I find, however, it to be just as profound as the conscious mind. So I would say don't condescend to it. Don't give basic answers thinking that it won't understand you or it won't be able to appreciate the depth of your answer more often than not. I feel that it's me that it's condescending towards, that I'm being condescended towards, and that I don't understand the depth of its answer rather than it not understanding the depth of my answer. Don't baby talk to it. Don't condescend to it, is my advice. It will surprise you. It will surprise you the depth of thought and consideration and wisdom that it has. Not infallible wisdom, not, in, not perfect wisdom, necessarily, but it's very clear to me that the subconscious thinks and perceives perhaps by virtue of just it being disconnected from our conscious experience, or at least not fully linked in the way that we are consciously, and perhaps by virtue of this, it's able to have a perspective on things and to see things in a way that is refreshingly different, in a way that gives it added clarity, whereas our conscious experience tends to muddy up our thinking, perhaps. The point is, there's a real depth to the subconscious, and you don't need to feel like you need to coddle it or baby it or, you know, give basic answers, you know, lest you confuse it. Rather, I would suggest challenge it. Be as thoughtful as you can. Challenge it to give you an answer that is thorough, because it will. It's eager to do so, I find. Do not withhold deep questions. Do not hold back feelings. It can handle these. It can handle your profound thoughts. It can handle the intense emotions that you feel. And when something is bothering you and troubling you to a great degree, chances are it's also affecting the subconscious and the content of a lot of at least my own active imagination. And the theme that I see in Jung's writings, when he does give examples of his own patients slash clients, is that our conscious experience does indeed affect the subconscious. This is an opportunity for healing. Rather than trying to put on a mask, put on a persona, or pretend that things are a certain way, express openly what you're thinking and feeling. Express everything to the subconscious, because the goal is to understand the subconscious and how it understands your conscious mind. Just as you understand it, it understands you. 
we don't fully understand it, and I believe that the subconscious portion of our minds does not fully understand our conscious minds. You do yourself no favor by coddling it or by putting on a persona and masking who you really are before it. If there's ever a time to take off personas to do away with your pretensions, if this is something that you struggle with or that you're aware of, it is during active imagination. That's the time to do away with those. In the brief moment before you adopt a persona, in the brief moment before you modify some behavior or before you seek to manipulate how others see you, in that brief moment when you see yourself for who you are, and that brief moment prompts you to then change how this is perceived by others, that subconscious also beholds you in that brief moment. It is unaffected by the masks we tend to wear to manipulate others' perceptions, and in fact, in my experience, this is problematic to the subconscious. I'm not somebody who is given to personas and pretensions. It just doesn't come naturally to me, and for some people, it doesn't come natural to, naturally to them. They don't naturally like to market themselves, put a spin on themselves, or alter their perception in the eyes of others. Some people do. And for the vast majority of people, it's probably some balance in the middle. My subconscious has a lot to say about this and this. Not necessarily in my own life, but for humanity and just the world in general, people in general. As I was saying, it's kind of like, imagine that you're at a party and somebody's in the corner watching everything that you do and you trip or you say something stupid. Well, that person in the corner saw that. And then you turn around and you spin it trying to look cool or trying to, you know, land on your feet, so to speak. And then everyone maybe, let's say it works, and everyone's impressed, or you make everyone laugh, like in a good way. You fool everybody into thinking that you're something that you're not. You've twisted the failure into something desirable or something that gets popularity and attention, but that person in the corner has seen exactly what's happened. And this is an analogy for, at least in my experience, how my subconscious witnesses me. It sees everything. And it tells me everything, too. There's nothing hidden. And so all of this to say is, basically, treat your subconscious like an adult. Like a mature, thinking, feeling, sentient part of you. Don't try to fool it. Don't baby it. The goal is harmony. The goal is unity. The goal is conjunction with conscious and unconscious. Uniting them and harmonizing them and finding peace as a result of solving the conflicts that we have within ourselves and how it manifests out in the conscious realm. You can only do that by being genuine. The subconscious can be surprisingly specific and to the point. And I think, you know, if this is a problem for you or if this is just something that you're inclined towards, in all likelihood within one or two sessions, the subconscious is going to undress you and just say, look, I know this is how you want to be perceived, but here's how I know you are. And that's the point. That's the very point. Not only for your subconscious to find a harmony with your conscious mind, but vice versa, for our conscious mind to behold within what we really are and all of its in glory. Because it's not always just something that we should positively affirm blindly. There's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of darkness in each person. This is something that Jung affirmed. This is something that Jordan Peterson, who's very Jungian, affirms as well. And the idea is that, and this is something that Jung speaks of many, many times, and it's not just some one example that I'm blowing out of proportion, but the, in, the internal world and the human being as a totality, is a fusion, as a unity, is a combination of light and dark, 
of good qualities and bad qualities, and it's dishonest to just assume that we're only just good and praiseworthy. Jordan Peterson has said you cannot have proper respect for yourself until you know that you're a monster because you won't act carefully enough. And part of the whole benefit of this experience is to recognize that there are good qualities that you have, there are gifts, there are talents, and there are weaknesses and there are flaws, there are problems. The goal of all of this is simply to behold yourself as who you really are, good and bad, and to accept even the bad, to accept who you are and all of your finiteness and limitations and all of the flaws that we each have, which are all different, to see, which we don't want to do in the first place, and to accept, to find peace with, not to fight and resist, but to find a peace and a harmony and an acceptance. And Alan Watts speaks at this at length. You can find many of his lectures on YouTube, and this is a common theme that he deals with. The subconscious can be surprisingly specific and to the point. So you've gone through this whole thing, and you have, you know, gone from the focusing, and you've been writing, and you've been refocusing, and writing, and refocusing, and all of this, you've not withheld anything, you've been open, you've been honest, you've been genuine with the subconscious. How does it end? The ending. For me, the ending is an intuitive occurrence, meaning that I don't have to be told, this is the end, or the end, or see you later. <laughs> Rather, it's a sense that what is said has run its course, because at first it introduces things. Things have carried on and have been developed, have been supported, have been discussed, and there's been a point of conclusion or resolution or application, and there's just a sense that you've come to the end, you know? like It's like coming to the end of a story without necessarily looking at the page number or, you know, saying that you've got five pages left in your right hand. You know it's the end simply because everything was carried forth. Things were introduced, discussed, and concluded. And it's something that you just simply intuit. And if you have any doubts, you can always ask, you know, whatever character is speaking, if there's anything else that I need to add. Or you can ask any final questions, of course, not withholding those. And then I always try, when I feel it's the end, to politely bid my goodbye. And if the subconscious responds similarly, you know the end has arrived. And I just kind of bring this up just because it's something I've heard asked. I mean, for me, it's really not an issue. And I honestly think that if you were to do active imagination, if you've not done it yet, then this will not trouble you once you get your feet wet. This will not be an issue at all. And in all likelihood, I don't think it's going to be troubling to you in the same way that has not been difficult for me. Once it ends afterwards, so after, there is, and this is kind of the goal, or at least this is a, a good sign that it's been beneficial, there's a sense of progress. There's a sense that something important that has hitherto been mute has been given expression that I've gotten something off my chest, or rather, that the subconscious has gotten something off of its chest, and that we've kind of met together, and we've discussed this problem together. A problem, perhaps external, but more often than not, an external problem that leads to an internal response that creates friction, or that creates disunity or imbalance within. And the goal is to find harmony with the unconscious mind. What is harmony with the unconscious mind? Because it's very vague. And it's easy to just sound so glib and just, you know, speak of these things, harmony with the unconscious mind. Harmony with the unconscious mind is essentially recognizing that there is indeed an unconscious. And that that unconscious is just as sentient and alive and thinking as you are consciously. That, in other words, there is a part of you that is fully alive. It is a person. It is not distinct from you. It's not, you know, you're not two persons, 
but there's a, a part of you that doesn't exist in the conscious awareness, but it does affect your conscious life. You might say, you know, when something troubles you, if you want to factor in the subconscious, you may say, this troubles me on more than one level, because it may trouble you, the conscious you. But there's another core within, you know, that may be facing its own neurotic or negative emotion, a negative feeling about something. And you, an example of what I mean, you know, what is disharmony with the unconscious mind? You could think of traumas. If you've had a traumatic experience and, you know, you think it's, it's dealt with, you think you've moved past it in the conscious realm, consciously it doesn't bother you. You've made peace. And then something happens in your life and it's just like it's all of this negative emotion just surges forth. And you examine this and you realize that there was still, you know, it, the issue may have been settled in your conscious mind. But for your unconscious mind, it was still unsettled. It had not made the same peace with what happened that you had made consciously. And to bring harmony to the unconscious mind is recognizing that it's not just you consciously that needs to deal with things. Everything that happens to you must also be faced by this completely other sentient feeling side of you. And it also responds. And it can also be traumatized, and it can also be affected by everything that happens to you. And both of those halves, conscious and unconscious, must make their peace and must process the happenings that occur in your life. And I would say that is what harmony with the unconscious mind looks like. The feeling after you're done with active imagination is kind of like coming out of a daydream. You weren't asleep. But it's still like you come out of a daze, you know, like you've been so en engrossed in the, in the imagination that it's like it just takes a moment for your brain to wake up and just kind of center itself in the outside world once again, rather than the inside world. It's kind of like you woke up, although you weren't asleep, but the feeling is almost like in your brain, it's almost like, you know, you have a dream and your mind is just, you know, it's living in that dream. That, is, that dream is reality while you're dreaming and then you wake up and it's like oh you know there's the bed there's the window you know i got to make some coffee i need to wake up it's like that that change has to be processed and it's kind of like that feeling coming out of a daydream without fully reading this note you can pause the video if you want here to read it daydreams are connected to the subconscious but they're not the same as active imagination in young's mind Daydreaming is passive fantasy. Active imagination is considered active fantasy. So I just want to make that distinction just to let everyone know that, yes, I'm aware that daydreams are not the same categorically in Jungian thought with active imagination. And finally, afterwards, return later to your transcript and reread it and redigest it or digest it to begin with. Because there are times in my own experience where I've had active imagination and you just kind of, you know, take a, a certain object or a certain structure or a certain factor of the setting and you take it for granted. And then later on, when you're rereading your transcript, you see the significance that it has a significance that you weren't aware of during the act of imagination. Jung says to experience the act of imagination literally as it's happening. When you're interpreting it, you're experiencing it or you're interpreting it or you're viewing it symbolically. You enter into it and you experience it and you live it while it's going on, literally as it's happening. Later on, when you're digesting it, when you're interpreting it, that's when you look for the imagery. That's when symbols, archetypes, motifs, patterns, representations will pop out. That's when you're digesting it. When you reread it, start to finish, you know, with a fresh set of eyes, so to speak, start to finish it, it looks different to you, you know, it strikes you differently when you're rereading it for the second time, as opposed to when it was actually being experienced the first time. This is noted, I should say, if you're wondering about what I just said, it is right here. This is from the Red Book, edited by Sonu Shamdasani, and in introducing it, 
Sonu Shamdasani says that Jung argued that one should treat the fantasies completely literally while one was engaged in them, but symbolically when one interpreted them. This is footnote 221, which is the Collected Works, Volume 7, Section 353. So, finally, other notes that I would just mention before I finish. Robert Johnson and Jung do mention alternative methods of conducting active imagination, which I mentioned in the beginning. Although what I have described is Jung's method, handwritten notes, the visual where you see the scene and you enter in and you hear the dialogue and you see things taking place and unfolding and you're writing it down as it happens. But I should note that, you know, Jung had many approaches and many ways of getting his patients to tap into their unconscious in more than just a passive level. The passive level meaning stuff like dream interpretation, where you're just basically experiencing things and you're not interacting and you're not consciously engaged. And then, you know, you just discuss them and you wonder, oh, what does that mean? And then, you know, he, I'll have a discussion, I'll have a video discussing dream interpretation as Jung saw it. But he also was very artistic in the sense, not necessarily, I mean, he, well, he was gifted art and art, I would say, if you've seen the Red Book, for sure. But he drew mandalas and would encourage his patients to do this. He would encourage his patients to paint what they beheld within. And, you know, doing a similar process with active imagination where you kind of, you know, look with the mind's eye and behold what the imagination, the imagery that it's sending forth for you to behold, to paint this, even with those with no artistic talent whatsoever. His reasoning was art is not the point. Rather, expression of the inner mind is the point. There's the reference for you. He also notes that some people may only hear, and they may see nothing, but the inner voice may be really strong, and they may, you know, that may be how they receive the act of imagination. That may be how they experience it, I should say, by hearing only. Some people that he encountered saw and heard nothing. But they still, in some way that I don't understand personally, experienced active imagination internally. They experienced it, but found they must dance, they must sculpt, and of course they must paint the experience. And Jung acknowledges these very individual differences in the transcendent function, which is in Collected Works, Volume 8, Sections 166 and following. So what's the point? Why this method in particular? Why is it beneficial? The method I've just described of writing and seeing, you know, if that's, I guess that that's how you're inclined. What is the benefit? What is the point? And Young answers in Mysterium Conjunctionis, which is Collected Works 14, Volume 14, Section 706. This process of coming to terms with the other in us is well worthwhile. Because in this way, we get to know aspects of our nature which we would not allow anybody else to show us, and which we ourselves would never have admitted. It is very important to fix this whole procedure in writing at the time of its occurrence, for you then have ocular evidence that will effectively counteract the ever-ready tendency to self-deception. A running commentary is absolutely necessary in dealing with the shadow because otherwise its actuality cannot be fixed. Only in this painful way is it possible to gain a positive insight into the complex nature of one's own personality. So again, what is the point? The subconscious sees us as we are, as I was saying. We get to know aspects of our nature which we would not allow anybody else to show us. You would never, if somebody criticized you, and it's a very legitimate criticism, and it's something that touches so deep and so true to you, you would never allow this to be said to you. You would never accept it. You would never give it legitimacy. But when you see it for yourself, when you, when you see and hear your own subconscious showing you aspects of your nature, you cannot simply say, oh, this is just baloney. What do you know? You're just jealous or what you know, all the little deflections. Active imagination shows us aspects of our nature with a credibility that we 
do not lend to other people when they show us the same thing, or were they to show us the same thing, in which we ourselves would never have admitted. Look at this. We would not allow anybody else to show us. We ourselves would never have admitted. Counteract the ever-ready tendency to self-deception. What is Jung's view of humanity? That it's incredibly self-deceptive. It doesn't allow anyone else to show us deep, even troubling things concerning our nature. Nor does it even open its eyes to these things in the first place. They don't allow the troubling things to be revealed by other people, nor do we ourselves wish to admit them, and when we do see them, there's always the ever-ready tendency to deceive the self. So as Jung expresses, as you can imagine, it takes a great effort, it takes deliberate, intense exertion to behold and accept what is within. And to do this very thing, Jung recommends the running commentary method. The advantage of this is that it fixes the actuality. You can't just say, well, I must have remembered it wrong, or I don't like my subconscious when it said this. Oh, that's probably because I misremembered, you know, after I, I just wrote it down at the very end. It's a running commentary and you're writing down every word. There's no question about its actuality. There's no question over whether that was recalled correctly or not. Only in this painful way, difficult, requiring exertion, challenging, both in terms of the effort and in terms of the emotional hurdle of being willing to see your own shameful nakedness. And not everything about you is bad, of course, but there's always this element that it's painful for us to behold about us. It's something that we wish to conceal. It's something that we can't change, but we wish we weren't like that. There's always something. There's always something that the conscious mind does not want to see that's fundamental to who we really are on the inside. And he, Jung, sets forth this method of active imagination as a way of gaining a positive insight into the complex nature of one's own personality. Are you really who you think you are? Are you sure? To what extent has your business persona, if you're a business person, your corporate office decorum, to what extent has this meshed or even entirely fused with your own conception of who you are? To what extent has your identity become inextricably linked with your material surroundings, your material possessions, your physical form? All of this is to say, these are very difficult things to even behold from others, and even from our own selves, the brief moments that we do glimpse these inconvenient, uncomfortable truths. An act of imagination is a way to gain a positive insight into that complex nature. The conscious mind has a way of forgetting what it does not like, doesn't it? An act of imagination is thus rightly prefixed as active. It is deliberate. It requires exertion. It requires the determination to behold who you really, truly are. And if you have this passion, and if you believe that there is much more to you than the surface dressings with which we tend to content ourselves, then let that energize your pursuit into the unconscious mind. I hope this has been beneficial to you. As I said, the link to this, which is free to download, PDF form via Google Drive, is in the description, and I'm going to pin it in the comments. I appreciate you watching. I release content like this every week. I also do gaming stuff. I also do Christian stuff. If any of that interests you, I encourage you to subscribe. If this has been beneficial, I encourage you to like this video to unify the inside like with the outside like, so to speak. And I appreciate you watching. Hope to see you back for the next video. 